The uh, telephone, Rick Garland, joins us, a Halloween staple on the program. Rick, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning, Rob. Now, I miss you being here in person in your period piece costume. So just uh, maybe next year. <laughs> we, we, we've got a wonderful photo of you, however, in your costume. Your, your, oh, your very nice. Up. Yeah, you, you got the lantern and everything, the beard going. Very nice. It's uh, Har Harper's, of, yes, Harper's Ferry, uh, speak, OB Joyful uh, Historic Ghost Tours. Yes, sir. Yeah, speaking of photos, we had a very interesting uh, last few weeks with some very impressive photos and probably the most impressive photo ever taken i think it was friday night and it's posted on our on our facebook page goes towards the harpers ferry on facebook as i'm standing at the head of the street named hog alley because the hogs are coming here back in the day and clean the town up um there was no one standing next to me i was had a big crowd so instead of standing on the middle of the street i stand all the way up the top of the street and face both sides of the street and someone sends a picture to me and says, I don't remember anybody standing next to you when you were telling this story. And no one was standing next to me when I'm telling the story. But in this picture is me, and just to the right of me, looking up at me, is a small child dressed as a 1915, 1920s newsboy. And, uh, you know, the typical little uh, coat, slacks, big hat on his head and looking up and he's holding something and he's looking up at me and I look at this picture and I say yeah there was nobody I mean I check everybody in on the tour I say hello to everybody where you're from what do you do you know get to know everybody a little bit sometimes it interplays with the tour there was nobody dressed in any costumes that night much less a little boy dressed as a newsboy from the 1920s mm -hmm. or 1930s and uh, so I posted that on our Facebook page, Ghost Tours of Harpers Ferry on Facebook. And we're getting quite the stir of comments from other ghost tours and customers and people posting other pictures that they've taken of Harper, uh, in Harpers Ferry over the years. So if you've not yet seen a, what seems to be a truly one of the most impressive apparitions, I mean, it's a full-bodied apparition, not translucent, you can't see through it. Um, check out uh, a few posts down on Ghost Tours of Harper's Ferry on Facebook, and you will, uh, I think, be quite impressed. I think the most incredible ghost picture I've ever seen. Very nice. And this is the first time this one's popped up? First time this one's popped up, and ever such vivid color. And, I mean, it really looks like a little kid standing there looking up at me, and there was nobody there when this picture was taken. Does that kind of freak you out a little bit, or are you used to this by now? No, I'm kind of used to it. You know, what you see more <laughs> often would be the white, smoky stuff. Yes. That, uh, And you don't see that a whole lot, but you see the white, smoky stuff, which on uh, Ghostbusters was named ectoplasm. Right. If you've not seen the Ghostbuster movies, you should do yourself a favor, and you and your kids, they're just hysterical. The old, especially the original ones, are just so funny. They were some great movies. Um, see that. Um, the, most, the thing you see most often are the orbs, the round circles, and they're always perfectly round or usually translucent, but they do come in different sizes, different light intensities, different colors. They're called orbs. Supposedly, they are ghosts, and supposedly the color of the orb tells you what mood the ghost is in. So, of course, big red orbs. Uh, not so good. Red but, is uh, bad. Yeah. To see like a full body apparition standing next to me is quite unique. Matt? Uh, Rick, how did you get involved in ghost tours of Harper's Ferry. What kind of, of attracted you to um, this particular uh, phenomenon, if you will, and, and then to, to give such tours? So um, depending upon your belief system, it was either divine providence or happenstance. I was conducting historical tours of downtown Gettysburg years ago. I want to say about 2005, 2006. It's hard. Hard to remember at this age, the years. And uh, I was also doing old-time music. I was a musicologist before my fingers went bad. I played the piano, sang songs, told stories about 19th century music and American Civil War music, Christmas music, some Scottish music, a whole lot of Irish songs. And uh, I was getting gigs down in Harper's Ferry over the years. And after a few years, they got to know me down there. 
and uh, the Merchants Association, and the mayor, who back at the time, I don't know if you guys remember, Mayor Addy, he was a history professor. And they uh, invited me to move my business down to Harper's Ferry 17 years ago. At that time, nobody was doing history tours in Harper's Ferry, not even the National Park. And nobody was doing old-time music down there. Of course, there were quite a few people doing it in Gettysburg. So they said, why don't you move your company down here? So I thought about it for a little bit and did. So I was in Harper's Ferry. I was conducting historical tours during the day. And on most weekends, I was playing old-time music at one of the pubs. And then uh, at a merchant association meeting, so Ann Culligan, who was running the ghost tours, uh, had taken it over from her grandma, Shirley Darty, the founder, came into the meeting and said, uh, uh, I'm retiring. Uh, I quit. I can't do the ghost tour anymore. Everybody's jaw hit the floor. Um, like, you can't quit. You can't resign. You can't retire. This has been here 37 years. It brings people into town. It's, it's a Harper's Ferry tradition. You can't quit. And she said, well, I can and I do. And uh, she's walking out the door. Everybody's jaws on the floor. She turns around and looks at me and says, you're here doing tours during the day anyway. Why don't you take it over? And everybody in the room looked at me and pointed their finger and said, yeah, you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of elected by popular vote. I didn't immediately say yes. I'd never done a ghost tour in my life. In fact, one of the reasons I, I left Gettysburg was when I first started working, there were, there were four ghost tours, and all of a sudden there were 24 ghost tours. Um, it was just incredible, the, the proliferation of ghost tours all of a sudden. And it, it had changed the way that I walked around Gettysburg during the day talking to people about my old-time music. Now, all of a sudden, when I went to talk to people, I got the old New York City brush off because I thought I was one of 28 ghost guys that had just approached them that day to sell them a ghost tour at night. <laughs> so I was like, oh, out of Gettysburg? Yeah, maybe that'd be a good idea. So it's kind of funny that one of the reasons I went to Harvest Ferry was so many ghost tours in Gettysburg were driving me crazy, and then after a year, ended up taking over the oldest ghost tour in America. Um, Shirley Darty uh, started this tour about 1970, so we are in our 53rd year. By far, it is the oldest ghost tour in America. And in 2010, and just after a year or two after I took it over, based on reviews sent into TripAdvisor.com, and I'm sure it's an algebraic algorithm of some type, but based on the reviews that have been sent in, I was voted the number one ghost tour in America. Congratulations. New York, uh, I mean, the uh, Washington, D.C. newspapers. It was on uh, one of the news channels there in Hagerstown. Um, I was swamped all of a sudden. So until TripAdvisor ever decides to review ghost tours again, I can continue to claim to be the number one ghost tour in America, and I am certainly by far the oldest ghost tour in America. Rick, this is John Gilstrap. Did you, um, were you a ghost believer before you took over the tours? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I'd had uh, several experiences over the course of my life. I'd never seen anything but heard, you know, footsteps and different things. A girl I dated in uh, high school, uh, pretty sure her, her grandmother was around keeping an eye on all the girls, making sure the boys that dated them do anything they shouldn't be doing. So I had some experiences there. Uh, nothing ever bad. You know, but I certainly believe in ghosts and uh, as being a Catholic, you know, ghosts are in the Bible. <laughs> we have, the, of course, the Holy Ghost, but there's, you know, ghosts are in the Bible. There's spirits, there's entities. Now, I don't talk to them and try to conjure them up like some of these, uh, some places call themselves tours. They're really ghost hunts. I don't get involved in that. That's very dangerous. You can drum up a demon if, and then not know it, and then you're in big trouble. In fact, one of the things that nobody ever tells you is 25% of the fellows on TV who yell and scream at the ghosts trying to conjure them up, uh, they end up seeking counseling from Catholic priests for demonic problems. <laughs> they don't tell you that. So, yeah, you know, Did demons you... will pose as ghosts. They'll make believe the day you're your Uncle Joe, your Aunt Sally, or whoever else they think you want to talk to, so you'll talk to them, and the more you talk, the more power they get. You talk long enough, maybe they come home with you. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah, no, we don't do that. We are family storytelling. Uh, we do encourage pictures because we get some really wild pictures from time to time. I, I can't say it's an everyday occurrence. You know, it's hit and miss. But over the years, there's been quite a few pictures uh, posted or uh, sent to us by customers that we usually end up posting on our Facebook page. You know, I've, I've been looking at the, the Facebook picture. That is, that's quite some uh, some picture. It looks like it's Photoshopped. No accusation there. I'm just saying it's it's that clear an apparition. Everything can look like it's Photoshopped. Exactly. And I, old, and I don't know much about technology, so I take it for what it looks like. That's 
what else can I do? So do you get Customers the sense that nobody was there? Said no, but we didn't touch the photo. This is what came out. So it's like okay. Do you get the sense that ghosts like to show off? Are they aware that that they're the point of your tours and they like to come out and perform? I do think that that's part of it. And I've had some other people who tend to be what we call sensitives. You know, I, I hesitate using the word psychic, um, but there are certainly some people who, when they take pictures, get a lot more phenomenon on a much more consistent basis than anybody else around them. Somehow they seem to be antennas and attract the stuff. So we kind of call them sensitives. And several have told me, yeah, you know, the ghosts want to be recognized. We don't really know why they're there. There's all kinds of theories. Um, unfinished business they think they can take care of. Maybe they just like where they're at. Maybe it's a really neat, cool, and unique place like Harper's Ferry, right? How many places look like Harper's Ferry? Very unique little place. Maybe they just like it there. They're going to hang out there. Um, I like to make a joke when, I, when I'm introducing myself on the tour. Maybe I've done something down here. I don't really feel like going up there and talking about it or admitting to it. So as long as I get away with it and I can avoid it, I'm going to stay down here and wander around as a coast. Um, and, of course, uh, a little, very little known, um, theologically, we Catholics, we have very strong evidence to show that at least some, some ghosts are souls in purgatory. Uh, evidence quite strong there. So who knows? It could be a combination of reasons. But, yes, it seems like a, some ghosts just want to be acknowledged that you know that they are there. And if you're having a problem with maybe them banging at pipes at night and so, or whatnot, if you just say, hey, could you leave me alone? I'm scared. I know you're there. Uh, could you leave? Most of the time they will. They'll leave you alone. When my wife and I first moved to Harper's Ferry, we had something running up and down the stairs waking us up at night. And I said, hey, you know, I just rented the apartment. I got nowhere else to go. I got to work tomorrow. I need some sleep. Could you leave us alone? They never bothered us after that. Never heard it again. Um, as I like to say, ghosts were people too once. <laughs> That's true. We, we suspect. Right? They're probably just reasonable people. Maybe they're stuck. Maybe they like where they're at, but whatever it is, they were people once. Oh, you know, tell them, hey, I'm here. No, I don't, I don't say have a conversation with them because, again, a demon might pretend to be that ghost. Now you got another problem to deal with. Please tell them, just please leave me alone. I'm, I'm scared. I know you're there. Um, that kind of thing. Now, the newspaper boy in the picture looks very friendly. And then if I scroll down a little bit on your Facebook page, we have uh, some much spookier, uh, nastier looking images in, in windows that are more classic ghosty yep. looking things. Do you ghosty looking, things? ghosty looking things. That's why I said that I, I'm, I'm a writer. I get technical to, I get term. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, they look more, well, kind of like horror movie kind of, kind of ghosts. Do you get the sense that there's a, a true spectrum of spectra where some are, oh. are mean and some are, are not? Absolutely, absolutely. There are, you know, there are hauntings. Um, I don't know of any in Harper's Ferry. It seems our ghosts are not mean overall. Um, but there are cases of, and I've had people come up to me and said, I live in a haunted house, and it was so terrible we left after six months or a year. And there are some ghosts who are mean and can just uh, be vindictive. Maybe they don't like you being in their house. But I think from the stories I get from customers, more often than not, you know, they just, like you said, they just want to be acknowledged. Uh, they just want you to acknowledge that they are there yeah, and that, you know, they can cohabitate. <laughs> With the, within the the larger literature of ghosts, you know, the nonfiction, not horror writers, but people who are writing about ghosts and such, are there any documented cases where a ghost has crossed the line and actually done harm to a human being? So I don't think we can document that one way or the other because I don't think you could um, figure out, well, was it really a ghost or was it a demon? Because there's a big difference there. Okay. Demons will what do, do harm. Absolutely, demons will do physical harm. Are no. demons also ghosts? I don't know. That's a totally, it's a totally different entity. Right. Rick, what's your schedule? I about angels with the Bible. You know, you? Angels are a totally different entity. What's your schedule like today for tours? So uh, we had two busy weekends. I mean, super busy like normal. Uh, the weekend before Halloween is always super busy. We did an extra tour Sunday night, and that was uh, fairly busy. Um, we don't normally do Sundays. We normally take Sundays off for church and family. Um, 
but the two weekends before Halloween, just to try to spread the crowd out and, 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 and meet demand. We do Sunday tours at 6 p.m. in addition to 6 and 8 Saturday nights. And uh, super, super busy. But t- what tends to happen, um, last night the rain scared people away. I didn't have many people last night. Um, they're trick-or-treating tonight. Halloween is not a big ghost tour night. We'll typically get 10, 12, maybe 20 would be a big group. Uh, we had over 100 people on Saturday night at the 8 o'clock tour. I saw the photo on Facebook that looked like they were pretty jammed up before the church there. Yes. Yeah, we filled up that piazza just about uh, almost shoulder to shoulder on the church on the, both of us. And really a big night this year, and I can explain why. Friday the 13th. Oh. I mean, I've booked of course many you know Friday the 13th. Then you get, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 people. We had uh, 70 some people on Friday. Why this Friday the 13th was any different than any others, I cannot figure out. But we were jamming on Friday the 13th in the, uh, this past uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago. What is the uh, the biggest attraction of your tour, Rick? I would say probably um, the, 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 the biggest story, certainly longest story, most detailed story, and probably most historically relevant story is going to be the story of Dangerfield Newbie, one of John Brown's raiders who was uh, with John Brown only because he was trying to get his family back from a master. He was a recently freed slave, but his wife and and, and kids, they were owned by a different master down near Brentsville, Virginia, which is next to Manassas. And, of course, what people don't realize is the economics of slavery were such that slaves were very expensive and worth a lot of money, um, as much as $1,000 back in 1860. That's like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 today. So masters didn't want necessarily, even though somebody might be generous and, and, and free their slave, and other guy might say, I'm not giving that up. That's $1,000 or more. The Dangerfield newbie tried to negotiate with the master of his wife and kids, and they actually came up with a number. He says, okay, if you raise such amount of money, um, I'll sell them to you. So Dangerfield went, and, of course, raising money as a recently freed slave must have been an incredibly difficult task to do. He raised a bunch of money, but when he came back, the master, master apparently told him, well, you know, you took too long. Uh, the price went up. I want more money now. So Dangerfield newbie – Desperate, desperate, heartbroken man. Um, his father had been a Scotsman. His mother was a slave, so he's half white, half black. He was biracial. Big guy, six foot one, uh, light skin, blue eyes. He is going out of desperation, joined John Brown's <laughs> supposed army, 23 guys, 22 guys. Um, John told him, look, if you help me take the guns in Harper's Ferry and we can end slavery, the first plantation we go to will be the one your wife and kids are on. I will get you your family back. So Dangerfield Newbies in, in Harper's Ferry on October 16th, 1859, with John Brown just trying to do something to get his family back. Well, you know, back then, before you shoot your gun, where are you going to stop first? I was, I was hoping that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, it's the 19th century, it's the 1800s. You're going to go fight uh, a bunch of guys who just invaded your town. Where do you where do you organize that? Where do you meet that to get organized? The saloon. Either the saloon or the, the church. Saloon. Yeah. The saloon. So they met at the Golf House Saloon, which was a local family-owned saloon. That place had their own special whiskey. Nobody else had it. It was the most popular saloon in town. It was the cheapest saloon in town. They had their own special whiskey that nobody else had. It was called, oh, Tanglefoot. Got it. Old Tanglefoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that was the name of their whiskey. So that became Command Post Central, and where all these guys met, and they became very, very organized. And then they're out there. you got a town full of drunks, local militiamen and citizens, shooting at the raiders, you know, uh, fought all day long. Dangerfield Newby will eventually, um, he will eventually be, be shot with, you know, we didn't make bullets in Harper's Ferry. We made uh, guns. We made a lot of guns. The bullets actually were made in Pittsburgh at another different federal uh, uh, institution uh, facility. So they were taking anything they could find and jamming them into their guns, and he got hit with a piece of metal. Some people uh, say it was a six-inch iron railroad spike that a fellow had cut the heads off. He'll be shot in the throat. He, his body will be desecrated and dragged from down in front of the Gold House Saloon, which was down by where the rivers meet, the point. And uh, 
he will be dragged to the uh, to Hog Alley and put out there for the, the pigs to finish off. Does so he... He's our biggest story, and there are a lot of pictures over the years of Hog Alley where there's a tall black man in a big baggy black suit with a big floppy hat, and we're pretty sure that is Dangerfield movie he's still there on Hog Alley. So that's he's he's going to be our biggest story. Sad sad tale, mm. right? How long did it take you to learn of and 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 understand those stories as you took over the ghost tours? And at the same time, through the years, how many additional stories have kind of been added as you learn more? Great question. So, uh, so I contemplated when I was invited to bring my history company down. Um, I then spent about eight months, six to eight months, reading every book I could get a hold of about Hopper's Ferry. Um, not nearly as many books are written about Hopper's Ferry as there is, say, a, a, uh, you know, Gettysburg and Antietam. We're quite overshadowed by them. So I read every book I could get a, uh, get a hold of. I was living and working in Gettysburg, and I kept coming down and walking around the town trying to figure out, okay, how do I put this together? Because it's not just one big event in Hopper's Ferry. Yeah, the John Brown thing is the biggest event, but our history is multi-level, multifaceted, multidimensional. We touch upon every era of American history. I'll throw out a little tidbit out there. Most people don't know. The American method of manufacturing, what revolutionizes the world's manufacturing, is not because of Henry Ford. And in fact, if you visit the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, Michigan, they will tell you we did not invent this process. This process was invented in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, to make guns for the federal government. We are the reason that the world has production lines, and we have, to have the total breakdown of labor into a series of machines easily operable by semi-skilled people. It comes from Harpers Ferry, not Detroit, Michigan. I did not know that. It, it is an incredible history here. So I came here doing history tours. I read all these books, figured out how to do a tour that people seem to like. And then I inherit the ghost tour. I already knew all the history of the town. And Shirley Darty, who was the founder of the Harper's Ferry Ghost Tour, Ghost Tours of Harper's Ferry, she wrote a book published about 1977. She didn't apparently didn't believe in ghosts from what we were told, even though she was Catholic, she should have. Um, she opens a restaurant in 1968, didn't believe in ghosts, but things start happening in that restaurant, which causes her to reevaluate her thinking on that pretty quickly. She starts asking questions around town. If anybody can tell her any history of the house, it might explain why there's weird things going on inside. Well, uh, she will eventually get a story that does seem to make some sense about part of it, but then she also starts getting stories from other people living and working in Harper's Ferry over the years what has been reported in other houses and on the streets. She'll even get some stories from National Park employees, what's been reported in some of the park buildings, recorded in their library. And I have documentation given to me from the family, some different pieces of paper that would indicate way back when the National Park was involved in her ghost tours. Um, they will not admit that anymore. <laughs> they want nothing to do with them. Somebody, I'm sure, in Washington at some point said, we want nothing to do with ghost tours. We are the National Park, and so they are totally out of the picture now. Um, but back in the day, um, they had something to do with Shirley's tour starting up. Shirley would also have been the person that started Harper's Ferry, very, very famous old-time Christmas festival. Uh, first two weekends in Christmas. I mean, uh, first two weekends in December, the Christmas festival, old-time Christmas in Harper's Ferry. Shirley had already started that, same woman who started the ghost tours. Both are 53 years old this year. There's a nice link to a uh, News 9 story on her that was uh, back in the day uh, that you have posted on your Facebook page, too. Uh, Rick, very good stuff. She was an amazing woman, a great storyteller, um, Irish Catholic. <laughs> so, I mean, I know I'm going to feed into a stereotype, which you may or may not believe in, but she liked whiskey and cigarettes. <laughs> and she had a voice, gravelly, scary voice to, <laughs> to prove, prove it. it yeah. I mean... You just, she just said hello to you and you'd be scared. <laughs> At the same time, she was a wonderfully sweet woman who told incredible stories. And so people, you know, she was there for, she told, she conducted the ghost for about 30 years or so. Rick, and she physically couldn't do it anymore. And her granddaughter took over for a few years. So we came. We're just about out of time. Uh, Dylan has the photo of the young boy that appeared in the picture. For those of you on our um, TV feed who didn't get a chance to see that, uh, and this, this guy, you couldn't see him during the tour, but he showed up in a photo afterward. And as John Gilstrap said, that does look amazingly 
uh, lifelike right there, like it was mm-hmm. photoshopped in almost. Uh, Rick. No, I'll always say if it is real, I don't know if it is or not, but if it is real, it is the most impressive um, ghost picture I've ever seen, it is. and I've seen a lot. Hey, uh, what is uh, the phone number to get in touch with you for a tour? Uh, 304-725-8019, and we conduct historical tours, no ghosts during the day, by appointment only, and then we do the ghost tour at night. Oldest ghost tour in America, again, 304-725-8019. Good to talk with you again, Rick. Great to have you back on the show. Hey, thanks, uh, Rob. God bless.